Ruth 2, chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds, and may you have a full reward for the Lord. Um, from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's bow for prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So we are uh, continuing our series uh, this morning on relationships. We're shifting now to the fruit of the spirit of faithfulness, of faithfulness. And we're calling this series Recipes, right? Relationship Recipes, Relationship Recipes. And, and my hope for the whole series is that for all of us, there will be something in one of these sermons that will help us have a relationship grow stronger, become better in all the things. And, and I just happened uh, some time back to receive one of Tennyson's 1980 vin uh, vintage uh, cookbooks. And so we have been including that on the a recipe from that on the back of our uh, uh, sermon notes, sermon notes. So you get the sermon notes out and, and there's scriptures on one side and have that ready because we'll be looking at some of those scriptures and and I trust something God will lay on your heart. And, and the recipe today might as well say, just go to your pantry, take everything out, put it in a pot, cook it up. Because it is crazy how much stuff is there. And I was very hesitant to use this recipe because of the title. But then I did a little bit, not a lot, just a very little microscopic bit of research. And this word is a Spanish word. There's another word that's an English word that's spelt a little bit different. And so we're in good shape. And so we'll move on. We've also been sharing recipes from Mrs. Brock's kindergarten class. Mrs. Brock's kindergarten class from the LK schools. They're Lyndon Kildare schools. And a couple of my kids, I won't use their names, went to Mrs. Brock's class. And uh, she offered me several years worth of her uh, Mother's Day cookbooks. And we've got one today. And we have, I, I was looking a little closer, and there are uh, plenty recipes for chicken noodle soup. There's also a lot of recipes for chocolate cake. We've already done at least two for each of those, and we're back to the chicken noodle soup today. This one's from Blake. Blake's recipe requires 20 breads, one chicken, six roosters, <laughs> 10 noodles, mix all together, Cook 10 minutes, serves two. So I would try the one on the back of the sermon notes first. I'm not sure I would touch this other one a lot. So, so as we want to make our relationships better, this is an old survey that I came across from uh, the Gallup, Gallup group. And uh, it was talking about the vitality of congregations and, uh, and, and how congregations can, can help the spiritual needs of people who go there. And this is uh, what it, it was mentioned most about vital congregations. And among them, where people come and go and they have, it's meaningful and has a purpose. Vital congregations are a place where people come to experience deeper relationships. They come to be appreciated and respected. They come to be listened to, they come to listen, but they also come to be heard. Vital congregations are a place where people are growing in faith and where they're developing and maturing their faith. Hopefully those are all things that we're working on. What I've come to believe in all the years that I've been around is what people crave most is unconditional love. People crave most unconditional love. They crave a place or a person where they can go and they know no matter what, there's acceptance and there's love. 
Now, now, I don't think that that means there's approval of bad things that are being done, but they know that they will receive acceptance and, and love. And you know, almost all moms I've met, not all, but almost all, they get this. They get this. When moms have kids, the unconditional love switch goes on, and, and they have that for their children. And for most... There's, there's not anything that would keep them from loving their kids. Now, for me, you know, mom, it was hard for me to see this unconditional love in my mom, but I saw it overdone in my grandmothers. I knew at my grandmother's houses, I received unconditional love, and I received a lot of chocolate chip cookies. Right? And so... I, I, when I talk about unconditional love, one of the phrases that I'll put together is this one. The kind of love I think that God wants us to have for one another is unconditional love. And I think the kind of love we're shoot, striving for is, is the kind of love that the very best grandmother would give. Love the very best grandmother would give. And where can, they, where can people go and experience that love? Well, friends, my suggestion would be that they experience it right here. That's why we, we, we're, we're, we're continually talking about and focusing on what Jesus taught about loving one another, what the scriptures share about how we are to love one another. We're, we're to love folks that are easy to love. We're to love folks that are hard to love. We're, we're to love those folks that are sharp, and we're to love those folks who are, are dull. Don't, don't look around. No. no, no, no. I'm going to read from Colossians 3. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. We've been talking about relationships that go the distance, relationships that we hope will last a lifetime, and that brings me to, to a relationship that we all hope have, lasts a lifetime, is that that's when couples get married. That's when couples come together and get married. And, and, and when, they, when they come and get married, in, in our tradition, if, you, if we're using our book of worship, we'll ask, we'll ask questions. Will you love? Will you comfort? Will you honor? Will you keep forsaking all others? Be faithful as long as you live. And then, and then just a little bit later in the, in the service, we, we ask the, the couple to say vows to one another, and, we, and they say the vows. We ask, you know, will you have and hold? Will you, will you be there for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, in love, to cherish until we are parted by death? And then we end it with, this is my solemn vow. You know, that's the kind of, of pledge that, that Ruth made to Naomi when Ruth said, where you go, I will go, where you lodge, I will lodge, and, and, and on and on. Ruth, Ruth made a very similar type of pledge to Naomi, and they wound up leaving Moab and going back to Bethlehem because Naomi saw no hope for them in Moab. And she felt like her best bet was to get back with her people. And she encouraged Ruth, you know, you should stay with your people. But Ruth said, no, I'm going with you. I'm going to be with you until I die, is what Ruth said. You know, it gets me thinking, it's like, okay, how many relationships are we a party to? Of course, if we're married, we have our spouse, but there may be, we have some close friends. How many of these relationships do we have that, that we expect to go? for the rest of our lives. And then the second question might be, what are we bringing to those relationships so that those relationships have a chance of lasting the rest of our lives? Uh, 
our, our, our younger folks are, are struggling mightily. Uh, folks in their 20s, folks in their 30s, they're struggling mightily to, to, to get into these relationships, to even find people that they're willing to, to, to commit to for in, 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 in reality shows or rife with uh, these situations. We, we, you know, we look at divorce trends and how more than half of folks who get married wind up getting divorced. And, and, and those of us who are sort of in that business, we understand that, that there are times uh, of, of anniversaries where, where there are more divorces amongst people, you know, six months, one year, five years, 10 years, 20 years. And most recently, what I'm hearing is folks who've been married 40 years. There are spikes in the number of folks who've been married 40 years. And, 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 it, and I marvel at that. I haven't quite made, made 40 years, but I can't imagine uh, that. But, but it goes back to the importance of, of bringing to the relationship, because what we bring is often what we're going to get out. We, we have a, a thing where uh, we, we have to control our anger. Anger, I think, sometimes pays a big part in this, and, and the willingness to forgive that we've touched on before is so, so important. You know, we talk about this, and one of the, one of the statistics that amazes me is that, that, that couples who, you know, practice their faith. So we, we talked about how, well, about half, more than half get divorced, but, it, but if you're a couple who weekly practices your faith together, it goes from one and two to more than one in ten. I rarely get to couples before their, their marriage or their, their relationship is over, but when I do, I say, look, try the counseling, but start practicing your faith together every week. And statistically, that may be one of the most powerful steps you can take. In the study that I read about when I found this, it said it didn't matter what the faith was. You could be Christian, you could be Jewish, you could be Muslim, but just the act of the couple practicing their faith together greatly reduced the probability of a divorce. Talking about anger, and, and, uh, and one of the things I've learned, and, and, and this is true, I know it's true for me, and, and I've noticed it in other situations where if you're really angry with someone, you do not want to touch them. You don't want them to touch you. You don't want to touch them. I mean, if you're really, really angry, one of the first things that, that the, the other person won't do is they won't let you touch them. So, so our family, we like to tease a lot. We maybe like to tease too much. And so it's not uncommon for us when we tease too much for there to be anger. And, and sure enough, sure enough, I teased too much. And that child, whichever one it was, I've had four to, to, to practice on. I couldn't touch them. When, when, they, would, when they would tease one another. So we instituted a policy at the house that if we tease too much, we have, to do, we have to do a fist bump. And we called it a burn. And so if we tease too much and the anger got up, you know, we say, oh, well, look, we were just teasing. We didn't really mean it. Burn, you know, fist bump. That made a huge difference. And I was amazed to discover that sometimes that fist bump wouldn't occur right away. It would take 15 minutes or 30 minutes or usually not more than 30 minutes before the, but it came. And once it came, that meant the anger had reduced enough that physical touch was still okay. So if you want to know if somebody's really, really mad at you, just try to pat them on the shoulder. Try to shake their hand. Try to give them a fist bump. And then, and then, and then, then apologize and make, make it right. You know, when my, when my kids would get really angry with one another, one of the phrases I would tell them, I said, you've got to decide what's most important. Is the relationship with your brother or sister more important, or is the issue more important? 
And if, if, if your relationship with your brother or sister is more important than the issue, then let that issue go. Because most of us, I think, would recognize that, that meaningful relationships in our lives take priority over issues. Even, even, you know, even if we're right, which I always am, right? And we often think we are. But, but, but if our being correct destroys a relationship. So a long time ago, one of my friends, pastor friends, he made this comment to me. He said, you know, Mark, you can be right as a pastor and move every two years. Right? So is the issue more important? Or is the relationship more important? All right, the fruit of the Spirit verses there. And we talk about bringing to our relationships love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and generosity. And today we're talking more about faithfulness and how for us to be in a relationship that's going to go the distance, both parties will need to bring to that relationship a certain amount of faithfulness. The best definition of faith I know of is there at Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, for the conviction of things not seen. Uh, and then uh, in Ruth, we, uh, I, you know, I thought this passage in Ruth, chapter uh, 2, verse 11 and 12, our, our, our passage today, descri- Boaz is describing Ruth's faithfulness to Naomi. We, we, we read in chapter 1 about Ruth's pledge of faithfulness, but now we see that being described by an outsider. Boaz answers Ruth, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, how you left your father and mother, your native land, and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds. May you have a full reward from the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. You see, Ruth lived out her pledge and her faithfulness to her mother-in-law, Naomi, was recognized by Boaz. And we talked about Boaz last week. He's the owner of the fields where Ruth has been gleaning all of the grain and all of the crops. And Boaz instructed his, his laborers to make sure there was plenty for Ruth so that Ruth and Naomi would have something to eat. We are able... We, you know, the, the kind of love I'm talking about doesn't really make sense, right? To love somebody, no matter what they've done to you, that doesn't really make sense. You know, to, to value a relationship over issues that may be really harmful to us, that doesn't make sense. But the reason that we're able to do it, the reason that I stand before you and say this is how I suggest we live our lives is not not because it makes sense. It's because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ came and he died and he arose so that we could have a relationship made right with God. You know, if, if we had received what we deserve for our sins, we have no chance. But because God is loving and because Jesus Christ was willing, his death and resurrection make possible for us to live in a relationship made right with God. I'm going to read Ephesians 2.8. By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. And then Romans 5.1, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so let me ask this. As, as we think about the long-term relationship or relationships in our lives, what are we bringing to those relationships? Because what we bring, I believe, is what we'll wind up receiving. And sometimes we have to bring and not receive anything. Sometimes we don't bring anything and we receive. But if we never bring anything, the likelihood of receiving is very 
very small. Are we bringing love? Are we bringing joy? Are we bringing peace? Are we bringing patience? Are we bringing kindness? Are we bringing generosity? Are we bringing faithfulness? Are we seeing the image of God in others? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the love and grace that you give to us. And we pray, Lord God, that we would all have deep relationships. Relationships that last a lifetime. People we can call and they will clear their calendars and everything. Because they mean so much to us. And help us, Lord God, to be faithful in the relationships we have. And help us to be faithful, Lord God, to you. As we live our life seeking Jesus. In whose name we pray. Amen. 